The Dogman saved my family. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a Dogman story that I could tell you one way in about two minutes, but that version has no emotional impact. To tell it to you the proper way, well, I better go back to the very beginning and inform you about my little pet husky Malamute dog that I named Morley after this weird old dude that my father used to watch on TV. Don't worry, the Dogman story I have to tell isn't just seeing the creature walk across the road in the fog or something like that. I guarantee you this is a story that you have never heard before, because nobody in my family ever told it before. It happened to me, my wife, and my two kids, who are both under internet age and who I'm mostly going to leave out of this. I did consult with my wife before writing this email in order to make sure that my descriptions match what she saw as well. Although this is a pretty terrifying encounter, it took a surprising turn. That's not to say that I'm about to tell you a good time fairy tale. If my own kids hadn't had to live through this, I would shield them from this narrative. If you frighten easily, then you might want to skip the rest of this story entirely. Although if you scare it easily, you probably wouldn't be on this channel to start with. So I had an Alaskan Malamute Husky dog when I was a kid named Morley and he was my best friend. We found him in the backyard, and so we put out a food bowl, and he became our dog. Mostly he preferred to sleep outside, even in the cold, and he always remained at least partially wild. When he would on occasion come into the house, he was always on his best behavior. This made me wonder if he was an escaped pet, but my dad always told me he was wild. He's wild, but he's smart, that was how my dad used to put it. We tried putting a collar on him, but we would find the collar on the grass in the middle of the yard. Somehow he would manage to take it off of himself. There was no way to chain him up, and since he could leap our fences, there was no way to keep him on our property. We tried to bring him to the vet once, but gave up quickly, so I'm not sure you can exactly call him our dog. However, we sure bought him a lot of dog food and chewy toys and things of that nature, which were strewn around our, I mean, his yard. For all I know, he had several families feeding him because he was a really smart fellow. He didn't just take, though, and this is the reason I have to tell you about him before I can get into the dog man story proper. When I was a kid, I was tall but I was uncoordinated and gangly. Even now, coordination is an issue with me. I took up studying guitar to force myself to do one thing with my left hand and another with my right. I used to trip over my own feet once or twice every month. I was a disaster. I go to a gym and do specific exercises to mitigate my shortcomings in this area. But back then, it made me a target of bullies. One time... I was walking home from school, and three kids who did not live in my neighborhood were following me, taunting me with threats and making me feel terrified. I really didn't want them to know where I lived, as they were telling me how bad they were going to make life for me and my parents, both. I was just a kid. I wanted to cry. When one of the bullies moved past taunts to violence, shoving me down onto the sidewalk, I curled into a ball and prepared to get beaten up. After a few seconds, I realized nobody was hurting me. I was hearing people crying out in pain. Disoriented, I sat up and saw Morley tearing one kid's jacket off his body, bite by bite. The other two bullies abandoned that one and were running back the way they came. The boy under my feet was screaming for me to help him. His voice was higher pitched than a girl. I asked him what he was going to do for me if I saved him from the dog. And he cursed at me. A whole bunch of nasty words that I wasn't allowed to say myself. So I shrugged my shoulders, kicked the kid in the neck just very lightly and motioned to Morley. Sick him here, Morley. Get him in the throat. I heard that kid screaming and I heard Morley having a great time as I walked the rest of the way home. Don't worry, the kid survived, 
Morley wasn't a man-eater, and those bullies gave me a wide space from then on. They never told anyone that my dog attacked them, and really, was Morley my dog anyway? He came and went as he pleased. I didn't ask him to attack those jerks. He made that decision on his own. Even if I had told him to stop, do you think he would have? He was a force of nature, and he was my best friend. I jotted down notes before writing this email, and I actually listed out a few more times that Morley saved my life. Going over them now, though, I realize that in all those cases, he basically just showed up, looking mean and growly, and then I got left alone. He only actually had to do something to those bullies that one time, and then his reputation was sealed that nobody would dare mess with him, or me. After that, I used to call Morley a werewolf and a wolfman, because sometimes he would stand up on his hind legs and hug me. He started off taller than me, and we both grew until I was about equal in height to him by the time I had to go away to college. He passed away the week before I left for my dorm room, and it was the saddest day of my life. He was more special than any human I had met. Knowing him was like having a superhero for a friend. It almost seemed like he chose his time to leave us, as my childhood officially ended on that terrible day. There was no looking back. I was now going to have to take care of myself. My superhero friend, he had left in a physical sense, but I had internalized much of Morley's attitudes and personality over the years. When I encountered bullies in college, I found their weaknesses and I managed to cope with relatively little conflict. My internal mentor was that husky Malamute superhero dog that I had once known. I would say that I followed my own internal canine Mr. Miyagi's advice for years, and it never steered me wrong. I ended up happily married with two beautiful children. I earned enough that my wife was able to retire to take care of the family, and we have no complaints. I feel like I could never have gotten where I am on my own. It was only because of the examples set by my friend, who wasn't even a human being, but was wiser and more mature than most of us. During the pandemic, we were being advised to cover our children's faces up and then put them on a Zoom call instead of sending them to school. Whitney and I decided to buy a trailer for Winnebago that the four of us could live out of and then hit the road. We'd homeschool our kids, but our home would be a different part of the country every night. We'd give them a real education in real time in a real place. Rather than locking down, we opened up both our lives and the kids' minds. We started off driving south from the suburb of Cleveland that we live in, and by the winter, we found ourselves in Johnstown, PA. It's a very working-class place, and my wife's very working-class uncle prepared a fantastic lunch for all of us when we dropped in for a visit. He invited us to sleep over, but we were hoping to get down to the Laurel Ridge State Park, which is a bit to the southwest, in order to camp out and spend the night in our trailer. Although we did eventually get sick of the cramped quarters, that was still early enough in our extended road trip that sleeping in the camper was more fun than sleeping anywhere else, especially for the kids. So off we went, driving toward the camping park as snow started falling all around us. At first, it was so beautiful and serene, even the kids quieted down to watch the snow fall. We were driving on Route 271 through Pennsylvania, which is really in the middle of nowhere. I derived such great joy from that knowledge, too. There we were, the entire family outside, experiencing life, instead of being locked inside in the dark, smelling our own farts. It was so exhilarating and freeing. And then, in the next second, I saw what I immediately recognized as a mythical beast, a Pennsylvania dogman, running out onto the slippery road and skidding in front of our speeding camper. There was no way for me to have stopped that Winnebago 
even if the road had been dry. But it was not. I did hit the brakes, but then the huge, heavy vehicle, containing my family and everything we held dear, hydroplaned and slid down the two-lane highway, swerving back and forth. I tried to force our momentum to slow, and I felt the camper tip first left, then right. If we lost balance and tipped over, that might be the end of all of us. The creature in question stepped out onto the road toward my left, so I chose to turn right and try to drive off the road and around him. As I did so, another man-sized but canine-headed creature walked out in front of the vehicle. No matter what I did, I was going to hit something, so I chose to turn even further right and hoped that one or more of the trees at the edge of the woods would arrest our fall down the hill without damaging the trailer or us too badly. In fact, I sort of did succeed in that sense. It's just that the vehicle had tipped maybe 20 or 25 degrees to the right, and the only thing keeping us from tipping further and rolling down the hill was one or two of the bigger trees out there. I could already hear them cracking, and a sense of panic set in. What do you do in this situation? I felt fully alert and ready to do whatever was necessary, but I did not know what driving maneuver would get me out of this one. I decided to try to turn left and drive forward, but when I turned the wheel just a little bit, the trailer slid just a little bit on the cold, wet ground, making a sound that reminded me more of an elephant in pain than anything made of steel and glass. My wife shouted in panic that we were all going to have our stories ended that night. And then our kids, of course, erupted in crying and screaming. If I was having trouble thinking before, this chaos made me feel completely panicked. My hands shook, and I felt useless. Everything that I had always remembered, that I had learned from my canine friend, all of it was gone. And I was pathetic and frightened unable to save my own family. Outside, one of the monsters walked in my direction, and I became so scared that I almost felt like I was going to lose control of my limbs and breathing. He was a big, man-like monster of a wolfman, swaggering over to me more than walking. The odd thing is, when I noticed that, it sort of calmed me. He wasn't acting like a freak. He wasn't behaving in a manic way which I was. He seemed a lot calmer than me. Then, the dog man leaped up a bit and grabbed at my window, which was leaning over to the right. I screamed, thinking he was trying to get in, and I moved further to my right. That caused the entire vehicle to slide just a little bit more on the road, leaving us by then probably 30 degrees to the right of where we wanted to be. Everyone was crying, but I was doing mine silently. I could see the dog-headed men moving around outside, and I wondered what they were doing. It seemed as though they had some primitive form of communication, and that they were working out a plan. Were they going to remove one or two of the trees, causing us to crash down the hill? Then they'd only need a can opener to dine on me and my loved ones, not to mention whatever food we had in there, which a dogman might like. I heard the dogman moving around on that exact side, the side of the forest, the side we were tipping over onto. Were they doing what I thought they were doing? I could hear branches and even tree trunks snapping and cracking all the time since this started. Was it happening more or less since they went over there? I couldn't really tell. Multiple bumping noises hit the camper from the side of the woods, and we all shrieked in horror. My wife looked out that side and told me all the hairy monster men who were pushing on the trailer rhythmically. We started to sway back and forth, a little left, a little right, a little more left, and so on, until all of a sudden... Ba-bam! We had all four wheels on the ground and I hit go on the gas pedal. 
we rolled right back up onto flat ground, my front end sticking out a bit into the lane on the road. The kids cheered, and my wife openly wept. I didn't drive away. I needed to catch my breath, and I hoped the dogman didn't save us just to eat us. I was too emotional to drive for a minute, and I sat there gasping for air and trying to calm down as the big, swaggering, hairy monster dog walked back over to me. He looked at me with this really weird but very familiar expression on his face. My old dog Morley used to make that face, and I realized this dog looked like a Malamute and Husky mix also. Except that neither Malamutes nor Huskies are able to stand up on their hind legs and walk around like a badass action movie star. And then this feral, carnivorous, alpha male dogman walked over closer to me, licked me on the face as my family screamed. My wife was babbling about how now that monster had the taste of man on his tongue and it was our responsibility to put him down before he ate everyone else in the state. I was trying to block her out and understand what was actually happening. The dogman was moving his head to the side in a really strange way over and over again as he looked at me. That was what Morley used to do when he wanted me to scratch him behind the ear. Now, if you ever think a wild predator is asking you to scratch it behind the ear... I'd advise you not to do what I did next, especially if you're the only financial support for your family, then don't repeat what I did. But I was so wrapped up in that moment, I did reach out of the car, which caused several of the dogmen to adopt hostile posturing and begin growling loud enough to be heard inside the Winnebago. Well, until my wife started shouting something at me, I don't remember what. At any rate, he loved the ear rub. I did it for a while, and he moved to different positions and pushed hard, making my arm feel like he was going to break it off. The other upright canines appeared fidgety and uncomfortable through this, but they weren't growling anymore. I finally got all the big creature's itchy spots, and he dropped to the ground and scratched himself just a little bit more. The same way Morley always used to finish our ear-rubbing rituals. Satisfied, the big Duke Dogman ran on all fours into the woods on the other side of Route 271 in Appalachia. And the other dogs, yipping loudly in excitement, followed him enthusiastically. The Dogmen were gone, but we are still to this day cataloging all the ways in which that encounter changed our lives. With my wife, of course, it's all bad news. She won't allow the children out after dark. She won't allow herself to calm down. She won't allow me a moment's peace. For me and the kids, though, this has been a world and eye-opening experience. Now, the two of them are into dogman and monster stories. They tell me stuff about cryptids that I didn't even know. They're going to be experts before long, and I'm proud of them. Of course, none of the rest of my family can ever understand the deep and emotional impact this experience had on me. Do I think it was the reincarnation, at least in some sense, of my old dog Morley that came and saved us? While I don't understand the world well enough to say it couldn't have been him, I do try to find more mainstream explanations. Like... Maybe Morley and this dogman behaved similarly because they had similarity in breeding. Of course, that's making the huge leap to assume that dogmen which look like husky canines actually have husky blood, DNA, and instincts. Another giant-sized assumption is that asking for your ear to be scratched by tilting your head to the side repeatedly would even be an instinct. It seems more to me, like learned behavior. Wouldn't you need to have had your ear rubbed before in order to be asking for it to happen again? And who would have rubbed the ear of a dog-headed furry version of a young Schwarzenegger except a complete idiot like me? If I wasn't rubbing the ear of a dogman who remembered or knew of my old best friend Morley, then he must have known in some other way that humans are good at rubbing a canine behind the ear. He untilted our vehicle 
He saved our lives. Then, as a reward, he wanted me to help stop his ear from itching. I actually went and found a therapist to talk to about all of this. My wife wouldn't stop raising her voice and getting me very unhappy. I needed to get perspective and understand where she had reason to shout and where she might be being unreasonable. This therapist assured me that it didn't really matter too much if the dogman was the literal reincarnation of my best friend or if it was all just a remarkable assemblage of coincidences. What did matter was that, at least in a figurative sense, Morley came back and saved my butt one more time. She asked me how I felt about that. I had to admit, it felt great. My wife, of course, told me that I should keep seeing the therapist forever, but I didn't have a problem with what happened anymore, so I didn't feel the need to talk anymore about it. My wife likes unnecessary drama. I think it makes her feel comfortable in between actual drama, which of course she can't stand. The Dogman story was actual drama, and it helped me resolve issues from my childhood. So to her, that means I need a shrink, and that I'm making everything about me, and that I'm setting a bad example for the kids by encouraging their interest in cryptozoology. She keeps trying to make everything more complicated than it needs to be. This was not a complicated story. In fact, I can reduce it to one line. And that line is... <laughs> the Dogman saved my family. Lila Benefield Laurie. She likes to hear Dogman stories. Unless her last name is Lowry. I wouldn't know why, when, or howry. Please join us in thanking Lila Benefil Lori or Lowry for making this episode possible. She belongs to our PayPal Secret Uncensored Dogman Club, which features the same Secret Uncensored stories that our channel members get to see. Here to explain in greater detail is our international TV spokesmongrel, Henry Lee Dogman. Hank. Thanks, Biggie. And thanks to all of you for watching this far. If you liked it, please click like. If you'd like to see more of our work, please subscribe. And also click that bell icon if you'd like to be notified when we put out a new episode. To become an executive producer, you can donate to us through the thanks button under each of our videos or through our paypal.me slash peterbernard209 page. To receive cool perks like secret uncensored Dogman episodes far too wild to ever run on this channel, you can become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or Join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. Joining either at the $3 a month level or above gets you access to our over 25 hours of secret uncensored Dogman stories available nowhere else. Do you have a scary story about Dogman or some other kind of high strangeness that happened to you? Let us know by emailing us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or by leaving us a voicemail message at 804 Lascari. You may need to call back on that when it cuts off after I think three minutes. And if you don't want to do any of that stuff, thank you for simply watching to the end. Good night, and have a scary tomorrow. Scary, scary story. story.